Hi, I'm Nate Seberg. This is One Day Ahead. Welcome to One Day Ahead. This is Lord of the Flies in one hour. Reading it for real is a three and a half hour adventure. So grab some popcorn and buckle up because this summary will give everything you need to know in one third the time. If you don't have an hour, check out Lord of the Flies in five minutes, linked below. You'll get all the major beats and then you'll get on with your life. So what this video really is, is a stitching together of all the summary sections from my longer fly series that includes more analysis of key quotes and characters after the summaries you're about to watch. So if somehow an hour isn't enough or you wanna go more in depth on the themes or characters, check that out as well, link below. Finally, I also have a teaching unit for educators synced to all of this stuff, link below again, and a couple of other books besides. All right, enough of that. Let's dive into Lord of the Flies, chapter one. So this book begins with some intentional disorientation for the reader. It's meant to mirror the disorientation felt by the characters. They've just been in a plane crash, but critically, we don't get those pages. Instead, we start with the kid wandering around a crash site, which is referred to for the first of many times as a long scar. This framing introduces one possible reading of the entire book, the idea that nature undisturbed is pristine and that humanity mars that perfection and introduces evil to paradise. And we, well, they are that evil. Think Adam and Eve in Original Sin. Anyway, right away we meet Ralph, the boy with the fair hair. And another we will learn to call Piggy, who is described as fat seven times in the first two pages. I like that Golding, the author, he got to six and was like, Meh, one more. We never do learn Piggy's real name, but we can tell right away that he is needy, but also that he's like probably the smartest kid on the island. Piggy attaches himself to Ralph, who at 12 and a few months has lost the prominent tummy of childhood and is not yet old enough for adolescence to have made him awkward. As they pick through the jungle, Piggy announces proudly that he has asthma, which Ralph brilliantly rebrands as Asmar. Comic gold. Piggy also shows Ralph his thick eyeglasses he calls his specs. Having established the two things that make him special, Piggy abruptly stops and says, them fruit, I expect. He put on his glasses, waded away from Ralph, and crouched down among the tangled foliage. Yeah, Piggy's, Piggy's taking a dump. So not a great first showing from my guy Piggy. Rather than hanging around to listen to this, Ralph stole away through the branches. In a few seconds, the fat boy's grunts were behind him. Oh, Piggy. After a few minutes, they reach a protected lagoon where the boys swim. Well, Ralph swims while Piggy waves, citing his asthma. To which Ralph replies with, by far, the most quoted line of the book, say it with me now, sucks to your asthma. We also learn that Ralph's dad is in the Navy. Oh, and that while they were in the air, Piggy heard that an atomic bomb was dropped wherever they were going. And like, I don't know, a million people are dead. The upshot is this though, no one is left alive at wherever they were going to tell anyone else that they didn't make it. So no rescue is coming. Then Piggy returns to the jungle to poop some more. Piggy. In the lagoon, the boys find a conch shell and Piggy suggests Ralph blow it to call the other survivors. The shell booms across the island. Ugh. Sorry, beast. You're okay. Ah. Stay up. Is, uh, come on now. Come on, guy. Ooh. The shell booms across the island and they wait. The first to appear is a boy of perhaps six, sturdy and fair, his clothes torn, his face covered with a sticky mess of fruit. His trousers had been lowered for an obvious purpose and had only and had only been pulled back halfway. This is the third instance where a kid is just taking a crap in the jungle. Guys, what is happening? We've been here six minutes. Over time, boys, and they are all boys. In fact, there's not a female character anywhere in this book, assemble. Let's meet the rest of our cast, shall we? We already got Ralph and Piggy, but here we meet Jack Marydew. You'll want to keep an eye on him. Jack is the head of a choir of boys, literally like a singing choir. We meet the twins, Sam and Eric, and Roger, who's described as a slight furtive boy whom no one knew, who kept to himself with an inner intensity of avoidance and secrecy. And finally, Simon, a small, sensitive, kind-hearted boy with something medical going on because he faints dead away during the meeting. 
we find out that this has happened before. There's a bunch of other kids, but like these are the ones for us. The assembly votes Ralph chief over Jack, but then Ralph offers him an olive branch by letting him keep the choir as his. Jack rechristens the choir as his hunters and commits to finding meat for the survivors. The next order of business, recon. Ralph chooses himself, Jack and the slightly fainty Simon to ascend the only mountain on the island to get a look around. Jack accepts this invitation by pulling out a sizable sheath knife and clouding it into a trunk. And thus, Jack begins his long and proud tradition of randomly stabbing stuff. The trip to the island's central mountain is attended by a very heavy bromance between the three characters, especially Jack and Ralph. After a brief stop to push a huge rock down a hill, they finally reach the top where they discover that yes, it is an island and yes, they are alone. Rather than being overcome by dread, they love it. No adults, adventure, ownership by default. Eyes shining, mouth open, triumphant, they savored the right of domination. They were lifted up, were friends. On the trip back, the trio comes across a piglet caught in the jungle vines, which the boys call creepers. It's frantic, squealing, writhing. The boys rush the pig and Jack draws his knife and raises it to kill. But then comes a pause, which was only long enough for them to understand what an enormity the downward stroke would be. In this moment, the piglet escapes. They all know why Jack paused. Because of the enormity of the knife descending and cutting into living flesh. Because of the unbearable blood. But Jack offers a lame excuse. I was choosing a place. Next time, he snatched his knife out of the sheath and slammed it into a tree trunk. Next time, there would be no mercy. So between the rock rolling, the piglet, and the stabbing stuff, I will say this for Golding, he is not afraid of a little light foreshadowing. There will be no mercy for the next pig. Guys, there is a character on the island named Piggy. It is not subtle. And that is chapter one. Chapter two opens with a second meeting of all the boys on the beach, with Ralph holding the symbol of law, order, democracy, and civilization, the conch shell. At first, he looks to Piggy in something like desperation, but then all at once he found he could talk fluently. He holds the floor for like 11 seconds before Jack jumps in with the terribly exciting story about the pig caught in the creepers and how it got away and how he wanted to kill it and how he would have killed it, but how he didn't kill it, but how he will kill it next time for sure. Then he underlines his point when he slammed his knife into a trunk and looked around challengingly. Jack. Next, they make a rule that during the meeting, you can only speak if you are holding the shell. It works about as well as you'd think. At the meeting, they decide to make the best of their situation until they are rescued. And most of the boys find being marooned terribly exciting and adventurous, with one notable exception. A slight child, about six years old, is prodded forward by his peers. He is small for his age and has a large birthmark on his face. He has something to say, but he is so mortified by the attention that he can't speak. It's Piggy who kneels beside him and translates for the kid. He wants to to know what you're going to do about the snake thing. Ralph laughed, and the other boys laughed with him. The small boy twisted further into himself. Now he says it's a beastie. Beastie? A snake thing. Ever so big. He saw it. Ralph spends the next page trying to reassure the younger children that there is no beast, and then Jack offers his contribution. Ralph's right, of course. There isn't a snake thing. But if there was a snake, we'd hunt and kill it. We're going to hunt pigs, and we'll look for the snake too. But there isn't a snake. We'll make sure when we go hunting. Jack, not helpful. The meeting comes to an abrupt end when Ralph suggests they build a signal fire on top of the mountain in hopes that it will flag a passing ship. Utterly delighted with this idea and led by Jack, the boys dash off to climb the mountain. In the clearing on the peak, they light a bonfire using Piggy's glasses to focus the sunlight. The fire burns hot and fast with very little smoke. In fact, it's too fast for the kids to keep up and eventually they let it die down. In the lull following the excitement of the fire, they decide that wherever the shell is, they can have an official meeting and that the hunters are henceforth responsible for keeping a nice smoky signal fire burning all day. While they are talking, Piggy notices that the fire that was burning down has actually gotten out of control, noting sardonically, you got your small fire all right. The boys discover they have inadvertently lit fully half of the mountain on fire. While it burns, Piggy launches into a tirade. He's irate, upbraiding the kids basically for behaving like a pack of unsupervised kids. His critiques are relentless and far-ranging, but they end when he gets to the fact that he has been unable to even count the small children, who he calls little ones, because they won't stay still. 
And this line of thought leads somewhere disturbing. While watching the hillside in flames, he continues, and the little uns was wandering about down there where the fire is. How do you know they aren't still there? Something strange was happening to Piggy, for he was gasping for breath. The little un gasped Piggy, him with the mark on his face. I don't see him. Where is he now? The crowd was silent as death. Him that talked about the snakes, he was down there. A tree exploded like a firebomb. Tall swaths of creepers rose for a moment into view, agonized, and went down again. The little boy screamed at them, snakes, snakes, look at the snakes. And that's chapter two. So chapter three begins with Jack holding a spear on the trail of a pig. Jack seems quite adept at hunting. In fact, we will come to learn that he has become like obsessed with it. We also get this, his sandy hair, considerably longer than it had been when they dropped in, was lighter now, and his bare back was a mass of dark freckles and peeling sunburn. So obviously they've been there for a while, but these references to long hair, and there are a lot of them, more on them later, that is the way that we, me I guess we measure in hair time now. It's the best we can do. So they've been here for like, what? two inches or something. Really, no one is keeping track of the days. Jack tracks the pig, tosses his spear, misses, and heads home. Exhausted and thirsty, he returns to camp, where Jack finds Ralph and Simon building shelters. Ralph and Simon have just learned what every parent already knows, that little kids are garbage at manual labor. Ralph says they keep running off. Do you remember the meeting? How everyone was going to work hard until the shelters were finished? They're hopeless. They're off bathing or eating or playing. Ralph is frustrated and primed for a fight, and Jack has just spent his whole day hunting pig, but it quickly becomes clear that his time tracking is about much more than meat. Jack, Jack is in a place. When Ralph asks why the other hunters came back early, Jack says, I went on. I let them go. I had to go on. I, he tried to convey the compulsion to track down and kill that was swallowing him up. The madness came into his eyes again. So yikes. Ralph and Jack end up in a shouting match about the importance of food versus shelter, which like, let's go check with Maslow for a hot second. We need them both. This fight is the result of some really misplaced frustrations because they are the only ones save Simon actually working at all towards the group's survival. Next up, while talking, something strange happens to Jack. He forgets what rescue means, which is insane. Ralph says kind of stupidly, the best thing we can do is get ourselves rescued. That's top notch, Ralph. But then we get this. Jack had to think for a moment before he could remember what rescue was. Rescue? Yes, of course. All the same, I'd like to catch a pig first. He snatched up his spear and dashed it into the ground. Their pseudo conversation slash fight ends with this quote, highlighting the widening gulf that has opened between the two boys. They walked along two continents of experience and feeling unable to communicate. The chapter closes by following Simon. He's a strange kid and the other boys have started to notice. In these brief chapters, we are starting to sense that Simon sees things more clearly and perhaps feels more acutely than the other boys. This sets him apart from his peers and him constantly fainting probably doesn't help either. Simon is walking out into dense jungle solo for like a little me time. He has this zen, secret, leafy meditation namaste spot he found where he can close in the bushes and just like be alone in nature. But before he gets there, he sees a group of little ones, and Simon found for them the fruit they could not reach, pulled off the choicest from up in the foliage, passed them back down to the endless, outstretched hands. So in this book about the latent evil that lurks in us all, about the disintegration of societal norms and the rise of barbarism and unchecked power, here is a character who does something nice for like no reason. I mean, guys, don't get too attached to Simon because he's going to die. And that's chapter three. This chapter opens by taking us into the rhythm developing on the island. Golden laces emotion into the segments of the day, with the cool dawn being full of play and fun, the midday oppressive heat something to be avoided but not feared, the evening is a time of comparative coolness but menaced by the coming dark, and the night bringing with it fear and restlessness. The social group on the island has split between little ones and big ones. These stratas lead markedly different lives, only really coming together for meetings since they are full of drama, and Ralph bears at least some resemblance to the authoritative adult world they remember. We return to the real action when Golding briefly introduces us to three little ones who are playing in the sand. There's Henry, who was a bit of a leader this afternoon. Johnny, who had a natural belligerence, and Percival, who had not been very attractive even to his mother, which is just mean, man. I bet Golding grew up with a kid named Percival who was just a little 
dick. Anyway, two of the older kids, Roger and Maurice, they come along and they stomp the little in sand castles because kids are just terrible balls of awful. When the younger kids split, Roger follows one of them. The kid he follows plays at the edge of the water and Roger stands just inside the jungle. To amuse himself, Roger starts lobbing rocks towards the kid, but there was a space around Henry, perhaps six yards in diameter, into which he dare not throw. Here, invisible yet strong, was the taboo of the old wife. Round the squatting child was the protection of parents and school and policemen and the law. Roger's arm was conditioned by a civilization that knew nothing of him and was in ruins. In the next scene, we join Jack, who's painting his face for hunting. But this act quickly becomes about much more than fun face paint. Jack suddenly feels a rush of power from this new pseudo-anonymity afforded by the disguise. The mask was a thing on its own, behind which Jack hid, liberated from shame and self-consciousness. The group of boys, all of whom are drunk on this newfound face paint power, dash off on another hunt with Jack in the lead, or more like lamely poetic uh, with the boy unleashed by Jack's face paint. The hunt is successful, but all is not well on the island. While the hunting party is out making their first kill, they forget the fire. It burns down to cold ash, offering no signal when a ship is spotted. In the movie, it's a helicopter. The movie is awful, by the way. Anyway, it's Ralph who spots it, and he is beside himself with desperation and anger and despair as he watches the speck recede into the distance. Ralph turned to the sea. The horizon stretched, impersonal once more, barren of all but the faintest trace of smoke. Ralph ran stumbling along the rock, saved himself on the edge of the pink cliff, and screamed at the ship, Come back! Come back! He ran backward and forward along the cliff, his face always to the sea, and his voice rose insanely, Come back! Come back! Acting. It's a desperate and terrible moment, and it's also exactly when the victorious hunting party arrives. They show up with all the tact of a marching band, swinging a gutted pick on a stick and singing, we are the champions at the top of their lungs. Or they would have been if Freddie Mercury wasn't nine when this was published, but you get the idea. No, instead the victory chant is, and I'm quoting here, kill the pig, cut her throat, spill her blood. The word you're searching for is yeesh. So Jack speaks first. Look, we killed a pig. I cut the pig's throat, said Jack proudly and yet twitched as he said it. There was lashings of blood. You should have seen it. The other boys pile onto the story, tripping over themselves with excitement. Everyone is babbling at once, except Ralph, who in his anger keeps repeating, you let the fire go out. Finally, they pick up on the hint that something is wrong here and the cacophony of voices stills. Jack adds helpfully, spreading his arms wide, you should have seen the blood. Finally, Ralph lets loose, near tears in his frustration. There was a ship out there. You said you'd keep the fire going and you let it out. They might have seen us. We might have gone home. So Jack is cowed, but he ducks the responsibility, lamely mentioning how they need meat. In his indignation, Piggy temporarily forgets his fear and lets loose on Jack as well. While Jack is willing to be dressed down by Ralph, he is not about to hear this from Piggy. He sucker punches him in the stomach and smacks the glasses off his face, shattering one side, which I'm pretty sure means they are exactly one glass lens away from everyone definitely dying on this island. Anyway, there's a big blow up, Jack apologizes, and finally Ralph moves forward saying, all right, light the fire. When the fire is hot, the group cooks the meat. Everyone gets some but Piggy, so Simon gives Piggy his portion. But then Jack leapt to his feet, slashed off a great hunk of meat, and flung it down at Simon's feet. Eat, damn you, I got you meat. Numberless and inexpressible frustrations combine to make his rage elemental and awe-inspiring. And just like that, we have a deepening of the battle lines on this island. Ralph as rational, in control, looking for rescue. Jack as passionate, power drunk, looking for meat. Or more accurately, looking for the thrill of the hunt. So the chapter ends with the boys falling back into reenacting the hunt. Ralph watches them play act from outside the circle and has had enough. I'm calling an assembly. I'm calling a meeting even if we have to go into the dark. Down on the platform, when I blow it, now. He turned and walked away, down the mountain. Drama, drama. And that's chapter four. So chapter five is essentially one long meeting. It begins with Ralph walking along the beach, having a think. As he goes along, he takes stock of his own body, his frayed shorts that are rubbing his legs raw, his shirt so stiff from decay it feels like cardboard. He dwells on his long hair and how he dislikes perpetually pushing it up from his eyes. Golding is showing us how Ralph is starting to take responsibility for the state of his own affairs and resolving to improve them. The kid's growing up. Ralph knows this meeting he's walking to is going to be important. It has to go well because he can feel things starting to slide sideways on the island. 
The sun sets, the meeting begins. Ralph brandishes the conch shell and he begins by going full on disappointed dad with the other kids. He lays out a laundry list of the things the group agreed to do but has let slide. No hauling of fresh water, no follow through on the shelters, no consistent use of the agreed upon bathroom location, and the big one, no signal fire. A failure that very well may have cost them the chance at rescue last chapter. Look at us, how many are we? And yet we can't keep a fire going to make smoke. Don't you understand? Can't you see we ought, we ought to die before we let the fire go out? Then he gets deep-ish. He moves from the practical concerns to a more abstract and fundamental existential threat. He talks about fear. He wants to address and straight up like decide on fear, which is kind of a blunt force approach to something pretty elemental, but the kid's trying. The fear really began with the little ones who have been talking about a beast in the night. Ralph understands that this fear is a poison. It is a threat to the group, so they have to address it. Jack tries first, and his approach is essentially to yell at them, saying everyone gets scared sometimes and that they should just shut up and put up with it. Piggy goes next, and he cites science to prove that there is no beast and thus nothing to be afraid of. Not super effective. Ralph's approach is different. He challenges the little ones to come forward with their beast stories so he can show how silly they really are. The first kid who comes forward slept walked into the night, then woke up and genuinely did hear something in the forest. We learned that what he really heard was Simon coming back from his zen, leafy, hiding namaste retreat spot in the middle of the night. With that cleared up, they move on to the next kid. It's Percival. You remember him? He's the kid from chapter four who had not been very attractive even to his mother. So Old Ugly comes forward, but is quickly overwhelmed by the fear and the attention. When he's asked his name, he goes into something of like a Rain Man-esque chant, just repeating again and again, Percival Weems, Madison, The Vicarage, Hardcourt, St. Anthony's, Hunt, Telephone. He finally breaks down into tears. The group pushes him anyway on the beast that he claims to have seen, and his story just doesn't hold up. Something that size, on an island this small, you've really seen it? Where could it be hiding? Where could it live? They got this kid on the ropes. They're showing him to be a fool. Nothing that big could survive on the island. Why haven't they seen it? What an idiot! Rationality is about to claim Victory, but then, through a yawn, Old Ugly comes out with the absolutely devastating, the beast comes out of the sea. Well, sh it's a brutal rejoinder, and Ralph, despite himself, actually turns around and gazes at the sea behind him. The assembly looked with him, considering the vast stretches of water, the high sea beyond, unknown indigo of infinite imp Impi always want to say impossibility. Freaking alliteration. Unknown indigo of infinite possibility. So that didn't go as planned. Next, it's Simon's turn. He apparently has done some deep thinking in his secret retreat spot because the kid really hits the nail on the head. He says, and I'm piecing it together here because there's a lot of yelling in the scene. Maybe, maybe there is a beast. What I mean is maybe it's only us. Well, obviously, right, kids historically not great with metaphor, so this goes right over their head. Next, the wheels really come off. The crowd suggests the beast is a ghost, and Ralph, in a last bid for rationality, amid all the chaos and babbling, turns to democracy to try to save them. He decides to put it to a vote to decide if ghosts are real, which is like insane, but also kind of a nice touch by Golding. By agreeing to vote, it's a tacit yet unconscious admission that all of this is really just coming out of their own heads. And also, they vote yes, ghosts are real. So the death knell of law and order comes when Jack seizes control by shouting through the din. He's reminded that speaking without the conch shell violates the rules. Bollocks to the rules. We're strong. We hunt. If there's a beast, we'll hunt it down. We'll close in and beat and beat and beat. With that, Jack leaps from the platform and leads the assembly pell-mell running into the night, whooping and screaming, mock hunting and laughing. Only Ralph, Simon, and Piggy remain. Piggy urges Ralph to blow the shell and call them back, but Ralph decides against it realizing that should he blow the conch shell now and they don't return, like that's it. His authority evaporates and with it, their only chance of rescue. The chapter closes with the three kids huddled close together, listening to the repeated inarticulate gibbering. Percival Weems Madison of the Vicarage, Hardcourt, St. Anthony's. And that's chapter five. So chapter six opens with a rare reminder that there is more happening on this planet than these marooned kids. There is a whole wide world out there and that whole wide world is in chaos. 10 miles above the sleeping children, an aerial battle rages. And though lights wink and flash across the starry sky, not even a faint popping came down to rouse the sleeping children. What does float down, however, is a dead guy. The body of a pilot floats down on a parachute and crumples on the mountainside. However, a gentle breeze yard by yard 
puff by puff, hauled the figure through the blue flowers over the boulders and red stones till it lay huddled among the shattered rocks of the mountaintop. Here, the body becomes lodged in something of a sitting position with its head between its knees. However, each time the wind blows, the lines tighten and the figure sits up until the wind drops, the lines slacken and the head sinks down again. So as the stars moved across the sky, the figure sat on the mountaintop and bowed and sank and bowed again. On an island of kids teetering on the edge of barbarism, it's not what you want. The action then turns to Sam and Eric, the collective name given to the two twins. It's kind of a cute touch. These boys were on fire duty, but they have fallen asleep. Anyway, the twins wake up, stoke the fire, spot the body, and freak out. They dash down the mountain in a panic and wake Ralph, who calls a meeting. By the time the boys are all assembled, the story has grown. In the version the twins tell everybody, they were chased off the mountain by a beast with claws that nearly touched them. The group argues about what to do next. Jack wants to lead a hunt, which is very on brand. Ralph is worried that if they go hunting, the little ones left behind will be in danger, and the solution of leaving Piggy, who's down to only one eye at this point, it doesn't really seem like enough. With the group under threat, Jack pushes the boundaries of his power by openly defying the conventions and traditions of the group. Piggy is talking first. I can't see proper, and if I get scared... Jack broke in contemptuously. You're always scared. I got the conk. Conk, conk, shouted Jack. We don't need the conk anymore. We know who ought to say things. What good did Simon do speaking, or Bill, or Walter? It's time some people knew they've got to keep quiet and leave deciding things to the rest of us. Ralph finally has to intervene here. He cannot let this open challenge to the group norms pass. You haven't got the conk, he said. Sit down. Jack's face went so white that the freckle showed as clear brown flecks. He licked his lips and remain standing. They talk over what to do, and it turns out there is one place on the island where Jack hasn't been yet, a sort of rock fort way down at the end. They decide to go there first to look for the beast's lair and then climb the mountain to relight the fire. Before they leave, and because of the stress from the Ralph-Jack struggle, something weird happens to Piggy. Piggy let out his breath with a gasp, reached for it again, and failed. He lay against the log, his mouth gaping, blue shadows creeping around his lips. Nobody minded him. The group of older kids eat and then take off. Then, as an aside, Goldie notes, they left Piggy propped up on the platform. <laughs> it's fine, he's dying, but they got like, oh, they got like a kickstand. So they're just gonna prop him up and then... Uh... The boys make their way to the end of the island, to a place where everything narrows to a thin walkway before opening up into something of a natural castle at the true bottom of the island. Ralph goes first and alone. He crosses the walkway and ascends the rocks, and he discovers... Nothing more interesting than a clutch of rotten eggs and pink tumbled boulders and guano layered on them like icing. The kids immediately set about climbing and playing. It's a party. And on top of what will become known as Castle Rock, the boys find giant but loose boulders set precariously on the edge. Looking down, they see the narrow bridge directly below. Golding happens to mention that should they tip one of the boulders down the hill... So the day's been long, the prize of the fort very exciting, and no one is stoked to climb the mountain to light the fire. Ralph has to put his foot down to pry the boys loose and remind them that rescue, not playing on rocks, is actually of paramount importance today. I say we go on, shouted Ralph furiously. We've got to make certain. We go now. Mutinously, the boys fell silent or muttering, and Jack led the way down the rocks and across the bridge. And that's chapter six. So this chapter picks up right where six left off. At Ralph's insistence, the boys have left Castle Rock and are climbing the mountain with a dual purpose, searching for the beast and relighting the fire. Along the way, the group finds pig droppings, and since the pig trail heads where they are going anyway, they elect to hunt, now following Jack's lead. Curiously, on the trail, Ralph daydreams about his life before. He's in a cottage with his parents. It's super sad. He remembers that mummy had still been with them and daddy had come home every day. Wild ponies came to the stone wall at the bottom of the garden and it had snowed. This kid just wants to go home. He remembers things in the cottage, including a stack of books, specifically a bright, shining one about Topsy and Mopsy that he had never read because it was about two girls. Which, in a book literally without a female character, is kind of funny. He's pulled from his reverie when an adult boar charges through the group, which is quite the thing. Chaos reigns. Jack is gored along one arm. Ralph manages to hit him in the snout. The boys regroup and find themselves exhilarated by the danger and the hunt and the blood, and they quickly fall into reenacting the moment with a boy named Robert playing the part of the boar, making mock rushes at the hunters who form a ring. It starts innocent enough, but quickly the excitement and the bloodlust takes them too far. The screams from the boar started as acting and the stabbing as pantomime, but that line 
it starts to blur, and soon Roger is screaming in real pain. They got his arms and his legs. Ralph, carried away by a sudden thick excitement, grabbed Eric's spear and jabbed at Robert with it. Kill him, kill him, the chant rose ritually, as at the last moment of a dance or a hunt. Kill the pig, cut his throat, kill the pig, bash him in. Ralph too was fighting to get near, to get a handful of that brown, vulnerable flesh. The desire to squeeze and hurt was overmastering. These freaking kids. So it's a near thing, it's a frightening thing, but they, they, don't, they don't kill him. It's close though. In the panting aftermath, Robert suggests that they use a real pig next time because you've got to actually kill him. And Jack responds offhandedly that instead they could just use a little one. And everybody laughed. Hilarious. They decide to carry on to the top of the mountain, even though some of the boys lose their nerve. Jack reassures the group that should they find the beast, he will kill it. And he punctuates this point by slashing with his spear. The trek is full of difficulties, but the crew makes it. Ralph, thinking about the welfare of all, which is very on brand, sends Simon to tell Piggy that they will be home after dark. Assuming he survived being abandoned during his asthma attack, of course. When they arrive at the final climb of the mountain, it is full dark, and Ralph wants to ascend in the daylight. But Jack says, I'm going up the mountain. Then he follows with the supreme sting, the casual bitter word. Coming? So this is about power. Ralph doesn't have a choice. Joined by Roger, the three boys climb into the night. They creep to the final ridge, then only Jack goes forward. He comes back with the daylights scared out of him. Ralph and Roger creep forward next, and they find in front of them, only three or four yards away, was a rock-like hump where no rock should be. The moon comes out, and before them, something like a giant ape was sitting asleep with its head between its knees. Then the wind roared in the forest, there was confusion in the darkness, and the creature lifted its head, holding toward them the ruin of a face. The kids lose it and scatter. And that's chapter 7. So chapter eight's a doozy, and it opens with Ralph telling Piggy about finding the beast on the mountaintop. Piggy, ever the representation of scientific mindset, is incredulous and utterly perplexed. He does not know what to do with this information. Ralph, on the other hand, is resigned, fatalistic, and despondent. He says that thing squats by the fire as though it didn't want us to be rescued. So we can't have a signal fire. We're beaten. Jack, though, he's got a solution. You'll never guess. What about my hunters? Ralph's response is a mistake. Boys armed with sticks. Oh, whoa, Ralph. First rule in politics, you got to support the troops. Jack seizes this affront as an opportunity. He takes his righteous indignation and calls a meeting. He makes a big play. Ralph said my hunters are no good. Ralph thinks you're cowards. Jack's voice went up tremulous yet determined, pushing against the uncooperative silence. He's like Piggy. He says things like Piggy. He isn't a proper chief. Jack calls for a snap election, a referendum on Ralph's leadership, but Jack has misread his constituents because he doesn't get a single vote. They still all like Ralph, perhaps because he's not demonstrably crazy. With tears streaming and feeling the heat of humiliation, Jack takes his ball and goes home. I'm not going to play any longer, not with you. He stomps off, but not before inviting anyone who wants to come hunting with him to join. In the aftermath of this episode, Ralph is touchingly concerned for Jack, mentioning that he will surely come back after sundown. Piggy, though, is free, finally. His biggest threat is gone, and he suggests the group build a fire on the beach instead. The group loves this idea and sets to it with a gusto. Piggy was so full of delight in expanding liberty in Jack's departure, so full of pride in his contribution to the good of society, that he helped to fetch the wood. Piggy, look at you. He's so excited he picked up a stick. Ah, oh, so proud, Piggy. As they gather wood, Ralph starts to notice many of the biggins have started to trickle away. The only named characters left in his camp are Piggy, Simon, Sam, and Eric. Maurice, Roger, Henry, Bill, they have all slunk away to join Jack. And speaking of Jack, He's going by chief now, by his own declaration. He's chosen Castle Rock as his base, but before he moves in, he decides to first lure more and more of the biggins away from Ralph by throwing a feast just down the beach. Nothing like a luau to really 
cement mutiny. But you can't have a feast without a pig. So Jack does what Jack does best, leads a hunt. And this one is a brutal affair. The hunter set upon a feeding mother, stabbing her with fire-hardened stakes. Well, they all do except Roger, the kid who threw stones at little Henry, remember him? He hits one of the piglets instead. So like, he's starting to freak me out. The mother is set crashing through the jungle. They run her down, kill her brutally when Jack finally slashes her throat. In the aftermath of the kill, at Jack's direction, the hunters mount the pig's head on a double-headed stake. That done, and in silence, the boys back away instinctively, and then Jack spoke loudly into the jungle glade. This head is for the beast. It's a gift. The silence accepted the gift and awed them. The boys make a plan to carry the meat to the beach, steal some fire, make a speech about joining them, then hold a feast and wait for the new recruits to roll in. From there, the narrative jumps to our boy Simon. Back at the beginning of the chapter, he had slipped away from Ralph's group to return to his namaste, introverted zen place. Simon needs a little alone time, but he doesn't get it. Instead of finding like butterflies and leaves, he finds a pig's head on a stick, which I think would bum anybody out. It would definitely harsh his high. Tough to meditate. Describing the pig, the half-shut eyes were dim with the infinite cynicism of adult life. They assured Simon that everything was a bad business. Simon is on something of a bad trip on these pages because for him, the head seems to almost come alive. The head grinning amusedly in the strange daylight, ignoring the flies, the spilled guts, even ignoring the indignity of being spiked on a stick. We will return to him in a moment, but first we jump back to Ralph and Piggy, who are musing on what is causing their society to break down. It's getting deep, they're on the road, but they are interrupted by a raid on their fire. Figures emerge from the jungle, exploding into the camp, stealing branches and scaring the younger children. Jack emerges as well, naked, painted in white and red and green. Listen, all of you, tonight we're having a feast. You can come and eat with us if you like. In the aftermath of the raid, Ralph's group has a meeting because that's what they do. It's pretty clear most of the group really likes what Jack is selling, and it's not even the temptation of meat, though that is there. It's the protection that Jack offers. When Ralph asks, why shouldn't we get our own meat? Bill answers, we don't want to go into the jungle. Ralph grimaced. He, you know, goes. He's a hunter. They're all hunters. That's different. Finally, the chapter ends with the most discussed, debated, and written about scene in the book, the second half of Simon's conversation with the Lord of the Flies. It's super clear Simon's hallucinating here. This book would actually be way less interesting if it really was a devil's head on a stick talking to him. But since it's a hallucination, then Simon is carrying both sides of this conversation. And he's a smarty pants because he gets it. He, they, all of them, they are the beast. Anyway, here goes. You are a silly little boy, said the Lord of the Flies. Just an ignorant, silly little boy. Simon moved his swollen tongue but said nothing. Don't you agree, said the Lord of the Flies. Aren't you just a silly little boy? Simon answered him in the same silent voice. Well then, said the Lord of the Flies. You'd better run off and play with the others. They think you're batty. You don't want Ralph to think you're batty, do you? You like Ralph a lot, don't you? And Piggy and Jack... Simon's head was tilted slightly up. His eyes could not break away, and the Lord of the Flies hung in space before him. What are you doing out here all alone? Aren't you afraid of me? Simon shook. There isn't anyone to help you. Only me, and I'm the beast. Simon's mouth labored, brought forth audible words. Pig's head on a stick. <laughs> Fancy thinking the beast was something you could hunt and kill, said the head. For a moment or two, the forest and all the other dimly appreciated places echoed with the parody of laughter. You knew, didn't you? I'm part of you? Close, close, close. I'm the reason why it's no go, why things are what they are. The laughter shivered Come again. Come now, said the Lord of the Flies. Get back to the others and we'll forget the whole thing. Simon's head wobbled. His eyes were half closed as though he were imitating the obscene thing on the stick. He knew that one of his times was coming on. The Lord of the Flies was expanding like a balloon. <laughs> this is ridiculous. You know perfectly well you'll only meet me down there, so don't try to escape. Simon's body was arched and stiff. The Lord of the Flies spoke in the voice of a schoolmaster. This has gone quite far enough, my poor misguided child. Do you think you know better than I do? There was a pause. I'm warning you. I'm going to get angry, do you see? You're not wanted, understand? We're going to have fun on this island, understand? We're going to have fun on this island, so don't try it on, my poor misguided boy, or else. Simon found he was looking into a vast mouth. There was a blackness within, a blackness that spread. Or else, said the Lord of the Flies, we shall do you, see? 
Jack and Roger and Maurice and Robert and Bill and Piggy and Ralph, do you see? Simon was inside the mouth. He fell down and lost consciousness. And that, friends, is chapter eight. So a storm is brewing, everyone. The air is charged and humid, and the clouds are building and dark and menacing and ready to unleash terror and hell, which incidentally is Golding's plan for the children as well. We rejoin Simon when he regains consciousness following his little chat with the pig's head, which ended in him fainting. My guy Simon, he is going to have a rough day this chapter, and it starts with finding that his nose is bleeding. When he's fully recovered, which takes a minute, he stands and says to the pig's head resignedly, what else is there to do? Simon sets off up the mountain. He is resolved to meet the beast. Though wary to the point of near collapse, he climbs the mountain and discovers the truth of the beast. It's just a dead pilot tangled in his own parachute. After puking his stomach empty, he took the lines in his hands. He freed them from the rocks and the figure from the wind's indignity. Simon, even nice to dead people. I'm really starting to like this kid. That done, Simon resolves to take action. He realized the beast was harmless and horrible, and the news must reach the others as soon as possible. He started down the mountain, and his legs gave beneath him. Even with great care, the best he could do was stagger. Meanwhile, after talking it over, Ralph and Piggy go to Jack's feast. Remember, Jack is throwing it to recruit explicitly away from Ralph, so this is going to get awkward. Everyone is there except them and, of course, Simon, and it looks like a good time. Everyone is feasting and playing in the grass, and Jack has himself set up on a throne of sorts, painted garlanded, which I assume means like wearing a crown, and surrounded by fruit and meat and coconut shells. You know, it's tasteful. Silence falls as Ralph and Piggy enter the party. Jack stands imperiously over them all until he raises his spear and commands, take them some meat. Next, Jack makes his big pitch. He got the meat, he can protect them from the beast. This party rules. Who wants to join my tribe, huh? Ralph fights back, citing the democratic process, the hope of rescue, all his greatest hits. The undecided, frankly, are leaning towards Jack, but then the rain, which has been threatening all day, finally begins to pour, and with it comes thunder. And that swings the needle back in Ralph's favor because he's got the hut. I love a good hut. But then Jack plays his trump card. Do your dance, come on, dance. Between the flashes of lightning, the air was dark and terrible, and the boys follow him clamorously. Roger became the pig, grunting and charging at Jack. From there, a riotous scene develops of boys dancing and chanting and pantomiming a hunt. Even Ralph and Piggy, under the threat of the sky, found themselves eager to take a place in this demented but slightly secure society. The fervor grows. It throbs, pulses, stamps, and growls. Lightning splits the sky and thunder booms and rolls. Everything is thick and urgent and terrible and growing. And right into the middle of this nightmare fever dream walks my guy Simon. Him! Him! The circle became a horseshoe. A thing was crawling out of the forest. It came darkly, uncertainly. The shrill screaming that rose before the beast was like a pain. Kill the beast! Cut his throat! Spill his blood! The beast was on its knees in the center, its arm folded over its face. It was crying out against the abominable noise, something about a body on the hill. And it just keeps going. They stab, scream, claw, bite, and tear. Simon falls off a cliff of some sort, and they go after him. And there on the sand, they set upon him again, until presently the heap broke up, and figures staggered away. Only the beast lay still a few yards from the sea. Even in the rain, they could see how small a beast it was, and already its blood was staining the sand. Also... You gotta assume. So two slightly mystical moments close this chapter. The power of the storm catches the parachute of the newly freed pilot. The wind lifts his body and carries it out to sea. Finally, the tide rises inch by inch, first erasing the blood that had stained the sand and then gently lifting Simon's body and erasing him beneath the waves. And that's chapter nine. Hangovers are the worst, especially murder hangovers. And that's what we got going on here. Ralph's group is having a rough morning as they try to grapple with the poor choices they made at last night's party. I've been there. And their reactions to taking part in the frenzied murder of dear sweet Simon are interesting. Piggy grasps for any explanation, any rational way out. He ventures that maybe Simon survived, or maybe he was just pretending to be dead. Then he veers into blaming the victim, which is super dark, before he finally lands on, it was an accident, said Piggy suddenly. Yeah, that's what it was, an accident. Spilling your drink, forgetting your phone, ritualistic group murder, accidents. Listen, guys, I've been through it. 
take some Advil, eat a bagel, drink lots of water, avoid bright lights, you'll be all right. Unlike Piggy, Ralph comes a bit closer to actually facing the truth of last night's events. This is their exchange. Piggy, huh? What are we gonna do? Piggy nodded at the conch, he's suggesting an assembly. Piggy, huh? That was Simon. You said that before. Piggy, huh? That was murder. It is a dark place, but Ralph, to his credit, goes there. Well, almost. He uses the word we to describe the events, but only once. And then he backs off that pronoun and corrects himself to they, inserting just a little distance into the whole matter. It's clear from the text that Ralph was definitely inside the inner circle during the murder. And I would love to know if he took part in any of the actual, like, stabby, stabby killing. The text doesn't say, and I suppose it doesn't totally matter, but I still would like to know. My guess is that is for sure yes, but it isn't actually on the page. Sam Sam and Eric, the only other big and still with Ralph, have even a better defense. They were both like, we left early. Did we miss anything? Was it a good party? Heard things really died about 11. Meanwhile, down at Jack's end of the island, no one seems to be going through the post-murder walk of shame. Everyone seems fine with what happened last night. However, things have taken on a decidedly militaristic vibe. There are centuries challenging anyone who approaches. A kid named Wilford has been tied up, no one knows why, and then is sentenced to a beating for some crime, apparently. And that's concerning. Our boy Jack holds a meeting, and he plays his greatest hits. One, we are going hunting. Two, we are going to have another feast. Three, Ralph and the others are not to be trusted. And four, look out out for the beast. Stanley, which first of all, who the hell is Stanley? Ventures, but didn't we, didn't we, um, excuse me, Mr. Chief Jack, I'm pretty sure uh, last night, didn't we kill something? Everyone said it was the beast, but it looked a lot like that shy kid who was nice to everyone. You remember that? Jack comes back with, no, how could we kill it? Half relieved, half daunted by the implications of further terrors, the savages murmured again. Jack, in one fell swoop, rekindles the fear of the beast and further imbues it with mystical properties. It cannot be killed. It can change form. Jack is not dumb. Fear is how he maintains control, so he keeps that fear alive. Bill points out they can't have a feast without fire, but Jack has a plan for that. He takes Roger and Maurice and heads out. Back at Ralph's camp, the diminished crew is struggling to keep a fire going, and finally they give it up and go to bed. However, they are awoken in the dead of night by creeping noises around the camp. Quite clearly and empathetically, and only a yard or so away from the back of the shelter, a stick cracked. The blood roared again in Ralph's ears. Desperately, Ralph prayed that the beast would prefer little ones. <laughs> Suddenly, all hell breaks loose in the camp. There is a tumbling fight. It's dark and confused. It's all tangled limbs and hitting and biting and asthma attacks and scratching and brutality like this gem, Ralph began to pound the mouth below him. Using his clenched fist as a hammer, he hit with more and more passionate hysteria as the face became slippery. Whoa. Also, we pieced together a few pages later that this was really Eric that Ralph is fighting in the dark by mistake. So whoops. Anyway, it's a mess. There were multiple attackers and they all withdraw at the same moment when they got what they came for. The chapter ends with Jack trotting back along the beach, exalted. The chief led them, trotting steadily, reveling in his achievement. He was chief now in truth, and he made stabbing motions with his spear. From his left hand dangled Piggy's broken glasses. And that's chapter 10. Piggy is pissed. He is indignant, and he is feeling brave. With the fire out and the glasses gone, there is no hope of rescue, and nothing left for Ralph, Sam, Eric, and Piggy to do but visit Jack's tribe. And a lot of pages are used debating how this should be done. Do we bring spears? Should we go with war paint? Ralph is firm, and it seems like he finally gets the picture. He wants them to wash, pull back their hair, put on clothes, go without paint, and bring the conch. Because we aren't savages. Nailed it. Piggy is in like, hold me back mode, and he is talking a big game, rehearsing what he's going to say to Jack Marydew. I don't ask for my glasses back, not as a favor. I don't ask you to be a sport. I'll say, not because you're strong, but because what's right's right. Give me my glasses, I'm going to say. You've got to. What's right's right? You've got to? Piggy, you have not been paying attention. After one more incident of Ralph forgetting what the fire is for and getting real salty about it, they're off to demand that the murderous, bloodthirsty, autocratic strongman do something nice. This ought to go well. The group travels in a sad little caravan, with Piggy so blind they have to lead him every step of the way. They arrive at the Neck, that's the constricted band of land that leads to Castle Rock. Their very first exchange is interesting. Halt! Who goes there? Ralph bent back his head and glimpsed Roger's dark face at the top. 
You can see who I am, he shouted. Stop being silly. Ralph is saying, look, we are not playing here. He blows the conch, a direct challenge to everything that's going on on this end of the island. In the silence that follows, Roger, the same kid who threw rocks at the little one in chapter four, took up a small stone and flung it between the twins, aiming to miss. Some source of power began to pulse in Roger's body. So, uh uh-oh. Jack comes out, words are exchanged, and the two leaders fight, but they refrain from actually using the spears to stab. They just like whack at each other for a while. Both get in some decent blows before Ralph stops and makes one more desperate appeal to the group. Remember rescue, remember getting home? What are we doing here, guys? Jack responds to reason, by orchestrating the capture of Sam and Eric. The twins are quickly surrounded by Jack's tribe and call out, oh, I say, which I love because it's just so British. They go on to add, this is poppycock, unhand me, you rogue, I said good day. And of course, God save the queen. It's at this point that Ralph just loses it. You're a beast and a swine and a bloody, bloody thief. He charged and the fight was on again. It's in the midst of this battle that poor blind Piggy rises to speak. He's booed because kids are dicks, but then he carries on anyway. He lays it out. Which is better, to be a pack of painted Indians like you are or to be sensible like Ralph is? Which is better, to have the rules and agree or to hunt and kill? Which is better, law and rescue or hunting and breaking things up? As he preaches, Roger keeps throwing his small stones, but then his hand comes to rest on a lever, poised under the giant boulder that overlooks the neck. To Roger looking down, Ralph and Piggy looked like a shock of hair and a bag of fat. Piggy holds the conch high while he continues his game of like, would you rather? And Jack slides back amongst his tribe, which was a solid mass of menace that bristled with spears. Seeing his chance, Roger, with a sense of delirious abandonment, leaned all his weight on the lever. The boulder comes hurtling down, and I'm not sure if this is comforting or even more awful, but poor blind Piggy never sees it coming. The rock struck Piggy a glancing blow from chin to knee. The conch exploded into a thousand white fragments and ceased to exist. Piggy fell 40 feet and landed on his back across the square red rock in the sea. His head opened and stuff came out and turned red. Then the sea breathed again in a long, slow sigh, and the water boiled white and pink over the rock. And when it went, sucking back again, the body of Piggy was gone. Ralph is thunderstruck. He can't find the words to express anything. But in fairness, he isn't given much time. Suddenly, Jack bounded out from the tribe and began screaming wildly, See? See? That's what you'll get. Viciously, with full intention, he hurled his spear at Ralph. Ralph turns and runs literally for his life. And that's chapter 11. Ralph is on the run. In fact, that's pretty much all he does this chapter. Run for his life, plead for his life, hide for his life, it's a party. The chapter begins with Ralph in hiding, deciding what to do next, and this poor kid is indulging in some pretty delusional thinking. He convinces himself that now that it's daylight and now that Jack's tribe has eaten, he can smell the feast, perhaps they will be more reasonable. This, of course, is real optimistic, but I I don't begrudge him because there is like nothing left for him to do. On his way back to Castle Rock, Ralph comes across that pig's head on a stick. While he knows it's dead, he can't help but feel like this head has some power. The skull regarded Ralph like one who knows all the answers and won't tell. A sick fear and rage swept him. Fiercely, he hid out at the filthy thing. Even after breaking the skull and taking the stick sharpened at both ends with him, he still backed away, keeping his face to the skull that lay grinning at the sky. When Ralph finally reaches Castle Rock, night has fallen and Jack's latest feast is in full dancing, chanting, probably murdering swing. But then Ralph has a bit of luck. The sentry's standing guard are none other than our old friends, Sam and Eric. It seems that after a bit of light torture at the hands of Roger, they were allowed to join the tribe. It's like the old saying goes, if you can't beat them and they'll definitely kill you, join them. It's a sad reunion with Ralph pleading for help and appealing to reason. Words could not express the dull pain of these things. He fell silent while the vivid stars were split and danced all ways. So he's crying here, which made me realize there has not been nearly enough crying in this book. Like, not even close. These kids are like 12. Anyway, the twins tell Ralph, you gotta get out of here. It's not safe. They tell him that tomorrow the hunt for Ralph is on. Ralph asks, when they find me, what are they gonna do? 
Sam and Eric dodge this question and shove meat into his hands. Ralph whispers his plans to hide in the thicket right next to Castle Rock since they won't think to look for him that close to home, and then Ralph slips down the rock. Before he leaves, though, we get this. Ralph calls from below, what are you going to do, meaning when they catch him. From the top of the towering rock came the incomprehensible reply. Roger sharpened a stick at both ends. Ralph's day ends in confusion, somewhere between reality and the dream world. He sees Piggy everywhere with his head empty and hollowed. He also hears shouts and cries of pain and panic from above and realizes dimly that at least one of the twins are in trouble. And as he curls up in a bed of ferns that adjoins the dense jungle, he passes out. The next morning, Ralph wakes to the sounds of a hunt. And today, he's the pig. Jack's tribe has spread the length of the island and they are maintaining a constant line as they search so that they can sweep the island as one long line thingy. Ralph wiggles deep into the jungle thicket and finds an opening that was actually created by Piggy's murder rock. He sets up shop and congratulates himself on a solid plan. He has the stick sharpened at both ends from the pig's head and is in a position where he can only be approached by someone who's crawling, meaning Ralph can like attack them at his leisure. The plan is working great until Jack shows up and lights the thicket on fire. It is pretty smart. It seems last night someone caught Sam and Eric chatting to the outlaw and they tortured his location out of them. Tough look for the twins. The flames spread and grow and once Ralph cannot even see through all the smoke, he launched himself like a cat, stabbed, snarling with the spear and the savage doubled up. There was a shout from beyond the thicket and then Ralph was running with the swiftness of fear through the undergrowth. While on the run, Ralph narrows it down really to three options, all of them pretty bad. One, break the line. Basically, play Red Rover. Once he's near the end of the island, turn around, pick a kid, break through the line, and head back the other way. Number two, climb a tree. This one isn't really what you'd call a long-term solution. On the plus side, he does get to take a break from all this running. On the downside, if he's spotted, he's probably real dead. And finally, three, hide on the ground, hope they walk by. He goes with this one because it's basically all he's got. It's got all the best aspects of one and two. It's hiding, which is no longer running, so that's good. And if he's found, at least he's not in a freaking tree. Anyway, Ralph finds another thicket and lays down. Now that he's stopped, he realizes the fire they've used to flush him out is spreading really quickly, and nearly the whole island is ablaze. The fire was a big one, and the drum roll that he had first thought was left so far behind was nearer. Couldn't a fire outrun a galloping horse? Glad you asked. Well, according to Wikipedia, which is exactly the level of effort I'm willing to throw at this question, wildfires have a maximum forward rate of spread of 22 kilometers per hour, 14 miles per hour, in grassland. Now, for a horse, I chose Sea Biscuit. It made sense at the time. And I learned also from Wikipedia that he clocked in at around 40 miles per hour at full tilt. So, Ralph, I know this isn't really the time or the point, but no. Not even close. Anyway, they find him, but not before Ralph has time to register that the stake he's holding, the one that previously was used to mount the pig's head, is sharpened at both ends, too. Jack and Roger mean to decapitate him and mount his head on a stake. It's not what you want. With this realization, the panic he feels hits new and terrible heights, and he bursts forth again. Ralph screamed, a scream of fright and anger and desperation. He shot forward, burst the thicket, was in the open, screaming, snarling, bloody. Back on the run, blind with fear and terror, he staggers onto the beach, out of options, trapped, pursued, and with nowhere else to run. He falls to his knees, and raising his head, he finds a white-topped cap. And above the green shade of the peak was a crown, an anchor, gold foliage. He saw the white drill, epaulets, a revolver, a row of glit buttons down the front of the uniform. A naval officer stood on the sand, looking down at Ralph in wary astonishment. That's not all. Behind him stood a cutter, her bows hauled up and held by two ratings. Those are junior enlisted men. In the stern sheets, another rating held a submachine gun. All this while in the distance, a cruiser bobs on the waves. Which is that. As the beach fills up with boys, all thoughts of ritualistic murder evaporate. The officer is perplexed and a little disgusted with what he finds. He explains that they saw the smoke and came to investigate. And it should be noted here that Jack did start this fire, so technically he did keep his promise. The officer looks at the paint and the spears, dismisses them as fun and games, then asks who's in charge. Ralph says he is, and then we get this, a little boy who wore the remains of an extraordinary black cap on his red hair and who carried the remains of a pair of spectacles at his waist, started forward, then changed his mind and stood still. The officer asks Ralph how many of them there are. When Ralph responds that he doesn't know, the officer says, 
I should have thought that a pack of British boys would have been able to put up a better show than that. I mean, yeah. Ralph thinks of Simon, thinks of Piggy, thinks of the horror of this past day, and grief crashes over him. The tears began to flow, and the sobs shook him. He gave himself up to them now for the first time on the island, great shuddering spasms of grief that seemed to wretch his whole body. Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's hearts, and the fall through the air of a true wise friend called Piggy. And that's chapter 12.